Uh, so as you, as you can see, uh, the title has slightly changed from critical thinking to thinking for oneself. That is not a substantial change in the topic, but more has more uh, uh, dramaturgic reasons you will see later. And uh, let me just say a few words before I start the talk. So uh, as you all know, thinking for yourself is a highly, uh, a highly cherished uh, enlightenment uh, slogan. And uh, according to the orthodox view, uh, you have to think for yourself to become a mature member of society as a citizen and an autonomous individual. And uh, it helps you with uh, resisting unreasonable beliefs and maybe even bullshit. But uh, as I will argue in this talk, thinking for yourself or oneself has also a dark side or many dark sides. And under certain conditions, it will be vicious and epistemically dangerous. And it may even explain the spread of conspiracy beliefs. Well, that's what I will argue. Uh, and we'll see that probably the slogan and a related norm of critical thinking will have to be constrained or restricted. So that's saying I start my talk and no, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Try it. Oh yeah, here we are. So I start with saying a few words about thinking for oneself, what, what is meant with, with that or by that. I think there are misleading suggestions around which come easily to your mind, namely someone thinks for herself if she voluntarily controls her th own thoughts. This is in some, some sense too broad because wishful thinking would then count as thinking for oneself. And I think this is counterintuitive, but it's also too narrow in, in the way that it excludes beliefs. I mean, if we assume that doxastic voluntarism is false, then you have no voluntary control of your beliefs, but somehow thinking for oneself should concern one's own beliefs. So another uh, suggestion would be that, that your doxastic behavior is reason responsive if you think for yourself, but that's certainly too broad because you can imagine someone who is just relying on what others tell him or her. So just relying on testimonial reasons and you wouldn't call such a guy uh, someone who thinks for herself or himself. So here's a better suggestion. I think that's in line with what everyone actually believes is, I mean, someone who thinks for herself uh, is basing her beliefs or doxastic attitudes such as suspension on available domain specific reasons uh, in contrast to testimonial reasons. And what is meant by domain specific reasons? I mean, here are some examples. I mean, if you come up with mathematical beliefs and you base that those beliefs on domain specific evidence, then you should, the, the beliefs should result from calculation of numbers. Or in philosophy, if you base your philosophical beliefs on domain specific reasons, then you should base it on philosophical evidence or philosophical arguments rather than on what someone else tells you about philosophy. So you can see the difference here. And uh, we can now, in a way, make this more strict, very strict, then thinking for oneself is close to critical thinking. And here's a, a quote from uh, Michael Humer, uh, who's characterizing this way of thinking. You gather the arguments, reasons, and evidence that are available on the issue from all sides and then assess for yourself. So that's at the center of critical reasoning. <clears throat> In this strict sense, critical reasoning then ignores testimonial reasons. So it's, it's, it's a way of, uh, a type of individualism or intellectual autonomy as it uh, was designed by Kant in his uh, essay on what is enlightenment. So there he says, as you all know, have the courage to use your own understanding without another's guide, guidance. But there's also a way to characterize thinking for oneself a little bit more broadly. So that's the broad sense. And here, when you think for yourself, the following must be true. Namely, whenever you rationally consider the truth of some proposition, P, 
whatever it may be about, you must never stop using your own domain specific reasons for P. So using domain specific reasons does not mean that you focus yourself only on domain specific reasons. So it may just be a part of your reasons. And in that way, uh, this broad way of characterizing thinking for oneself follows from the total evidence view. So if there's testimonial evidence available, and if you have domain specific evidence, then you should use both. And this way of characterizing thinking for oneself is not in tangent with the idea that you sometimes rely on testimony. I think that is better equipped to maybe concur with our intuitions about how good reasoning should be go on or should be shaped. So second point, what explains the spread of conspiracy beliefs that's more closely related now to the topic of our talk series. There is a, a good characterization by von Poyen recently, uh, namely that there are two ways of, to, of approaching conspiracy beliefs. The one is the rational conspiracist hypothesis and the other is a gullible conspiracist hypothesis. So the one way is to say conspiracy beliefs are basically based on rational skepticism. So uh, there are rational reasons. Uh, if you carefully consider the evidence, then you might come to conspiracy results. And the gullibility hypothesis just says, no, uh, uh, conspiracy beliefs are the results of a gullible mindset. So I think uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that gullibility is the currently dominant view. Uh, and according to that, uh, and we have heard this also in this series of talks, uh, again and again, the spread of conspiracy beliefs results from improper thinking. So maybe speculation, if you have not have beliefs which are not based on sufficient evidence or resistance to counter evidence. And relevant factors, and we have also heard about that, maybe prejudices, specific biases as the intentionality bias. So the idea that you know, a, a plot must be uh, planned by, by some invisible agent and cannot be just shit that happens. And then there's the confirmation bias, but also social factors like ideology, epistemic bubbles, groupthink, or other things we have already talked about, for example, that people uh, feel a loss of control or something like that in your, their group. And the background idea is that weaknesses in critical thinking make you susceptible to conspiracy theories and strength and critical thinking make you resistant to conspiracy theories. And here are some voices supporting gullibility so there's recent empirical data from the person I, I just talked about from Poyen, but also Lantiam and others, which say and suggest that there's a negative correlation between the ability to think critically and conspiracy beliefs. Uh, there seems to be some convergence on the data there, but there are also philosophers going in just that direction. So here's Philip Hübel who said recently, fortunately evolution has also given us reason that is the ability to distance us from ourselves and to think critically so that we can shield ourselves against mental shortcuts and recognize our own prejudices. This is tiring since it requires attention and intensive training, but it can save lives and prevent us from making fools of ourselves in believing ludicrous fake news and conspiracy theories. Or there's Kassam in his book on conspiracy theories the educational response to the spread of conspiracy theories clearly has a lot going for it. It connects with philosophical ideas of, about so-called intellectual virtues like open-mindedness, critical thinking, respect for evidence and curiosity. Or, this is not the last voice, but the last I want to quote from is Nussbaum uh, in her book where she defends the relevance of the humanities for dem democracy so there she says, when argument is not the focus, people are easily swayed by the fame or cultural prestige of the speaker or by the fact that the peer culture is going along. So Socratic critical inquiry by contrast is utterly unauthoritarian. The status of the speaker does not count only the nature of the argument. I think all those people go in the same direction. They suggest that critical thinking is helpful when you want to resist conspiracy beliefs. 
So here I'm my main thesis of this talk. So I want to, I want not to go against gullibility in general, but I want to say it's not the whole truth, it must be constrained in certain way. And I think that the rationality is correct within certain contexts. And we'll come to that. And I think lay people, if they think for themselves, may and under specific conditions will end up with conspiracy beliefs. And uh, for, lay, for that reason, uh, for lay people thinking for themselves is not always epistemically good. Sometimes it's epistemically dangerous and even vicious. So as a consequence, thinking for oneself should therefore be restricted. And uh, I already make two caveats. The one is, I do not want to claim that this is the only explanation of conspiracy beliefs. We have heard about so, much, so many interesting perspectives. I think it's, it's just has many causal factors uh, and many different explanations. And even if the way I want to approach this phenomenon applies, then it's often only one factor among other relevant causal factors. So there's a kind of interaction between different factors but it plays a relevant role in this acquisition of conspiracy beliefs. That's, that's the main claim. So here's maybe a broad sketch of how thinking for oneself may lead to conspiracy beliefs. So given that, that lay people think for themselves on the basis of limited domain specific evidence and limited relevant reasoning capacities, expert, uh, views will often profoundly diverge from what lay people find reasonable. And from the lay perspective, expert views thus tend to appear outrageous. And this very fact may provide the lay person with some reason to reject the expert view and to adopt some alternative theory that includes the thought that the expert view involves a big hoax. That's, that's the basic idea behind my talk. And I will, of course, go in smaller steps and try to, to make this more plausible. So here's a plan. Uh, I start with uh, some explication or some, some analysis, some uh, explanation of the, the major terms, which are relevant for my argument. Then I give you two examples uh, where I think it's visible how conspiracy beliefs are adopted through critical thinking. And then I will consider tr tr three different potential antidotes to this way of being led to conspiracy beliefs. So one would be that uh, we integrate uh, expert testimony in a, in a good way into the lay perspective. The second one is that we use methods of weight averaging or judgment aggregations to make progress. And the third one is the preemption view. I characterize this in a minute. This is the, the position I want to go for, I want to opt for, and for that reason, I will address challenges to this view, and I will also deal with deeper worries before I come to my conclusion. So here, let's start with, with the, the, the major of the crucial terms. So of course, conspiracy theories should be elucidated a bit. And here I rely on Neil Levy, who will be the speaker next week. So I think what's necessary and what Levi, Levi thinks is necessary is that theories, conspiracy theories, are in conflict with expert, with the expert consensus, and thus ought not be believed by lay people because they are unlikely to be true. Um, but this seems not to be sufficient. So, th so that's a nice example. Maybe some of you already are familiar to that. So there was the master student in psychology, Nick Brown, who discovered that the math be behind the broadly accepted happiness form formula, the formula says that you feel happy if the ratio between positive and negative emotions is, I mean, roughly three to one. And he found out uh, that this was false because it was relying on, on really bad calculation. So he was a lay person at that time and was going against uh, the experts, Frederiksen and Lozoda, Lozada, sorry. Uh, and later on, I think they changed the view. And there was also a, a publication. Brown was then assisted by Sokol. So the famous Sokol, who was concerned with the, the, the hoax you all know. And so this had impact. But so he was a lay person 
who found an expert belief to be false, but this was certainly not having a conspiracy belief. So what is missing here is that the expert consensus must not only be, uh, or need not only be, uh, must not only be uh, assessed as false, but must also involve some kind of hoax. So an intentional deception of the audience or lay people. I think if you take both together, this might be close to a good definition of conspiracy theories. Then let's quickly talk about experts. So I take it that an expert uh, um, has to satisfy the following two conditions, and that's also sufficient then. So the expert has to be substantially superior to the majority uh, of the peers, of her peers, about a certain domain. And so we can relativize it to domains and also times, uh, and must be substantially superior in the following two respects. The expert must uh, possess more domain-specific evidence than the majority, and uh, the expert must, uh, must possess superior reasoning skills uh, concerning the domain than the majority. And secondly, uh, the expert has also to be sufficiently reliable about that domain and forming her beliefs, and that on the basis of one A and one B. So the expert should be uh, Cross a, a certain threshold of reliability on the basis of thinking about domain specific evidence and being superior to, to the average. I think both must be satisfied. Um, and a lay person is someone who either um, does not satisfy one or two or both. And uh, I, I have examples, but I think maybe we can reserve this for the Q&A because I want to make a bit of progress. So what is what are outrageous judgments? I will also use that term. I think that's good. A good it's a good idea to think that some, someone takes a judgment to be outrageous at a certain time when this person has a strong feeling that the proposition is false or if that person has strong prima facie reasons to reject the proposition it need not be ultima facie uh, reasons, but at least strong prima facie reasons. And then we need to talk about the preemption view. So I think it goes back at least to Linda Saksepsky, maybe also to Joseph Ross. So on that view, a reason is a preemptive reason, uh, if and only if it's a reason for the proposition it justifies, and, and that's more important, that this reason renders further reasons for or against the proposition rationally unusable by the epistemic agent. So that reason, in a way, screens off all the other relevant reasons from being rationally usable. It's, it's a normative claim. And uh, Saksevsky I mean, puts it in the following formula, a preemptive reason is a reason that replaces other reasons that subject has. So replacing here is a normative claim, it's not a metaphysical claim such that the reasons vanish, but they are no longer rationally relevant. And the, the preemption view applies this to testimony. So the testimony of a recognized expert or team of experts provides the layperson with a preemptive reason to follow the expert's lead. So it's, it's a reason for what the expert suggests and a reason that screens off all the other reasons from being rationally usable. Okay, and it's, it's clear, I hope, at this point, that the preemption view conflicts with thinking for oneself, uh, even the broad sense, because it excludes a rational use of domain-specific evidence that is crucial for thinking for oneself. So here's the conflict. Okay, and now I move on to a, two uh, examples. The one is 9-11 and the collapse of the uh, Twin Towers. So, um, if I move the cursor, you can see this, right? Okay. So the official story, as you all know, by the government, but also by many experts, is that the collapse was caused by the impact of two aircrafts, two planes, which crashed into uh, the towers. Uh, but an interesting point is visible here in this diagram. So if you throw a stone from top of the World Trade Center, so 420 meters high, then it would fall down to ground 
within nine seconds. But the collapse of the twin tower, so this is the twin tower one, this is the second twin tower, are close in the velocity to a free falling object. And that sounds at least surprising. I mean, it's, it's not exactly the same velocity. Some of the true physicists have claimed that it's, again, the, the twin towers collapse within nine seconds. That's of course an exaggeration, but it's close to it, right? So notice a solid building made of steel collapses by an impact on the top or close to the top as if a stone was in free fall. That's, that's really surprising. So here is the reasoning from a lay perspective. And I, I quote from a trooper, her name is Rosie O'Donnell. You can find this in a, in a very, very interesting book on 9-11. There's all the relevant objections to the official story. And then there are uh, engineers and people from physics, all experts that show that this can be explained in a way, the objections. And so, but, but there's also this fantastic quote. So Rosie O'Donnell says, do you know how fast it took those towers to fall? Nine seconds, seconds, as I just showed you, this is not completely correct, but it's close to it. Nine seconds, you know how fast it would have taken something to free fall from the top of the building? Nine seconds, it's physically impossible. So the idea is that the difference between a free falling object and the collapse of the World Trade Center is so small that lay people cannot understand how solid, solid building or solid buildings like the towers collapse so quickly without any further causal impact. And here now, this is not a quote from uh, O'Donnell, but this is how, how her reasoning might, uh, how she might reason. So she starts saying that of the official story that Al Qaeda, uh, the Al Qaeda attack, obvious, uh, sorry, no. she starts with the thought that the official story, namely that Al Qaeda attacked the Twin Towers, uh, obviously does not fit the evidence of the towers collapse because it's too quick, cannot be explained this way. But there's an alternative theory that the collapse is a result of a controlled demolition. So there are bombs on each of the floors and that explains how the building, even such a solid building collapsed that quickly. And so one, of course, one should uh, only believe what fits the evidence. And for that reason, one should believe the alternative theory. And then adding to that, that experts do not believe, of course, what, what obviously conflicts with the evidence, uh, they come to the conclusion that the official story must be a hoax. So the experts do not in fact believe what they say, they try to intentionally deceive the audience or the lay people or the public. Okay, the experts response is as you might uh, already expect is they come up with a complicated calculation of all the causally relevant factors and come to the conclusion that nothing else than the impact of the airplanes, the crash of the airplanes is needed to explain the quick collapse. And I've just copied one page of one relevant paper here for, of Bazan, from Bazan and others. So you can see there's a lot of mathematics going on and this is going over pages. And so probably a lay person would say, I mean, the view that, that this solid building collapses that quickly is so outrageous that it must be false. The calculation is for me as a lay person completely incomprehensible. So probably experts lie to cover up the government's inside job. Okay, so here's a second example. It's maybe not that convincing. We can discuss about that uh, later in the q and I was looking for the best possible cases. I think the World Trade Center is, is a really, really nice example. Maybe JFK assassination is not that good, but let's see. So you probably are familiar to the magic bullet theory. And here we go. The official story says Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots at Kennedy and the first bullet missed Kennedy. I think that was for some time controversial. The Warren Commission doubted that. They thought that the first bullet might have hit Kennedy, but later on this was rejected. And the second bullet struck Kennedy in his back and excited through his throat. And the third one hit Kennedy's head and caused his death. So at the end, maybe shortly after the Warren Commission uh, 
was giving us the report. This was all agreed upon by the experts. But now the pro problematic shot is the second one. So it did not only hit Kennedy, as I just said, but also Governor Connelly, who sat in front of Kennedy in the car. And initially it was assumed that Kennedy and Connelly had been hit by separate bullets. But now you can see, this is a sequence of the Sapruda film. Uh, there's a film of the whole scene and it proved they could see by the frames of the, the movie uh, what the time intervals was, were. And so uh, it could be proved that the time interval between uh, the reactions of Kennedy and Connelly, where the time interval was so small that it was not possible that Oswald fired two separate bullets, right? That would have taken him um, three to four seconds. And you know the time interval between the two reactions was smaller than uh, half a second. And so, if Kennedy and uh, Con uh, Connelly had been hit by separate bullets, separate gunmen must have been involved. Could not be Oswald, and this was officially denied, as you all know. So we have a problem here. And uh, what is a problem? with a theory that a single bullet hit both. I mean, that's the natural way to think about it. The problem is, as you can see here, uh, and this was also a picture which was shown by people who thought that the assassination was due to a, a bigger plot of many people, maybe even the CIA involved, that the, the way of the bullet was like this, very curved and was a high velocity bullet. And nobody can believe that this is a way a bullet at that velocity. I think the starting velocity was 2,000 feet a second, uh, could be a, a, a plausible way to go. Also, the bullet remained nearly intact, although it caused seven bounds in Connelly and Kennedy. So that was also a puzzle or maybe a riddle to explain that. And so, in contrast to that, here are the expert voices. I quote from, from two reports. So here's the Warren Commission. There's very persuasive evidence to indicate that the same bullet which pierced the president's throat also caused Governor Connelly's wounds. So that's from the Warren report. And there in the appendix, you find some, something the army wound ballistics said the bullet that hit Kennedy first could have caused all his Governor Connelly's wounds. So both assume that it's one and the same bullet could be the same bullet, and um, uh, they do not see any problem. But here now is the way a lay person would think about it, right? The official single bullet theory cannot explain the evidence. I mean, such a Corby way is impossible for a high velocity bullet to take. So we need multiple gunmen to explain the evidence and hence the official story is false and probably a hoax. So I do not want to deal with this in detail. I just want to remind you that later on there was more evidence which made it clear that there was this one single bullet that can explain everything. So probably the locations of this Kennedy and Connelly were such that there's a straight way through for the bullet, which explains all the wounds. I think also Kennedy was sitting a little higher, which was not uh, assumed at the beginning of all these explanations. And there's even a computer simulation from someone, Dale Meyer, who, who worked on that 10 years, who shows you that there is a straight way through. Then people really found out later on that the deformation of the bullet exactly corresponds to its impact. So they just did not really take into account that uh, the velocity of the bullet was decreasing, rapidly decreasing. And so, I mean, I, they could in a way repeat this in experiments. And then fragments of the bullet in Kennedy and Connelly resulted from a single bullet. I know this is all still controversial. There was a recent movie, a second movie by Oliver Stone who raises doubts, but I think that that's the expert view here. Um, so what I want to suggest is not that the problem is solved, but just before this came out in the 2000, and I heavily rely also on Posner's book on it, the, the case closed which is really recommendable. Uh, it looked for the layperson clearly as if it could not have been one single bullet. 
And for that reason, it was reasonable to assume that there were more gunmen involved and so the conspiracy theory or the conspiracy belief took off. So we come to the antidotes. What is the key problem again? I mean, it's just repeating what I earlier suggested. So lay reasoning on the basis of a limited body of lay evidence typically results in rejection of expert consensus as outrageous. This motivates the further belief that the expert story is a big hoax. So when lay people think for themselves about expert views, they typically will end up with conspiracy beliefs. And this can also explain something which maybe is characteristic for conspiracy theories, which I did not mention in my definition. Kassem uh, has pointed out that there is something like a self-sealing character of conspiracy theories. So you cannot come up with counter evidence because every bit of counter evidence can be integrated in a theory and even makes it more plausible. So when we, um, so if, <clears throat> if the conspiracy theory is utterly plausible for the lay person, then everybody who deny, denies it uh, looks to be crazy to lay people or I mean, the reasoning looks outrageous, right? To deny something which is utterly plausible uh, refutes that counterposition by itself, so to say. And that's maybe exp one explanation of the self sealing character. So now the, the question comes up, what might block this kind of rational road to the conspiracy beliefs? So, because keep in mind, the lay people relied on their evidence or what they took to be evidence and they calculated quite reasonable to their conclusion. So how can this rational road for the layperson be blocked? And as I already uh, suggested, I will address or discuss three possible antidotes. The one is assigning heavy evidential weight to expert views. I think that's the, the, the strategy everybody ha has in, in mind at first. So assigning heavy evidential weight to the expert view and then trying to integrate that view into the lay perspective. Secondly, maybe social aggregation of judgment uh, will help. We'll consider that as well. And then as a first, uh, a third uh, option, we'll consider the preemption view. So let's start with, uh, with heavy weight assigned to expert testimony. So I think Michael Lynch has defended something like this when he says in his book, The Internet of Us, uh, when, for example, we aren't an expert on something ourselves, we seek advice from those who say they are. But if we are wise, we also get evidence of that person's expertise, namely references, degrees, or word of mouth. Moreover, we look for them to explain their opinions to us in ways that make sense, given what we, one might add, already know. So what is he, what is he claiming? He claims, in contrast to the strict view of thinking for oneself, you should at least sometimes trust experts, but only if you can identify uh, experts by, by their credentials. So this is directed against uh, blind trust. And only, and that's important for me now, only if what they claim can be understood from our lay person epistemic point of view. So this, I, I take this to be to, the same as saying that it should make sense from what we already know. But here's the objection. I think the crucial condition, namely the understanding condition, or you might say the plausibility check is problematic. Of course, it may work in some cases. For example, I mean, if someone tells you as a naive person that the, the sun uh, sorry, the earth rotates around the sun, then you might, by some pictures, be explained why it looks to you as if the sun rotates, but in fact, the earth rotates. And that might, might be explainable to the layperson. But in cases where the uh, views of the experts are outrageous or completely counterintuitive and even incomprehensible, this understanding might not work. So for example, with the World Trade Center again, it collapses so quickly and the experts come up with all this math, right? And nobody can really follow. So there is no way of integrating this 
to the lay person's understanding. So I think if that would be the condition, it's not a good antidote against these kind of potential conspiracy beliefs. It's just because the expert view cannot be understood from a lay person that on the, the view of uh, Lynch, they should reject the expert view. And that's what we want to avoid. So let's consider social aggregation of lay and expert judgment. I think that's also a natural suggestion here. So what happens here? I mean, uh, I start with weighted averaging. So the idea here is layperson people assign different weights to their own degrees of belief and to the experts degree of belief. So uh, in the formula below, I talk about credences, but it's approximately, I use it approximately synonymous with degrees of beliefs. Here, I mean, of course there are some problems. I don't want to discuss about it, but I just use it here approximately synonymous. So, uh, and the lay people give different weights to these degrees of belief or credences. And the weights should be proportional to their own trustworthiness ratio. So let's assume the expert is three times as trustworthy as the, the lay person. What is it? The expert is three times as trustworthy as a lay person. Then you have here a formula that says that after updating by the lay person, the credence of the proposition P should equal uh, the lay person's prior credence uh, multiplied by one third, three times as, no, maybe it's, it's three to one. So maybe it's, it's uh, 0.25 and expert credence is uh, multiplied by 0.75. In any case, the sum must be one and if the expert is an expert, the number resembling M must be greater than that of M. So you, you give different weights, proportional weights. Notice that the ratio of trustworthiness is not the same as the ratio of reliability. For example, the layperson might just might, might nearly be as reliable as the expert, but in no case. When the expert errs, the layperson is right. Then the layperson would get zero weight, right? Because it cannot, in, in comparison, it never uh, outweighs the expert beliefs. So it's really about the relative trustworthiness. And uh, problems here are abundant. So one problem is the lay people typically do not know the relative trustworthiness of the lay judgments. How could you say, for example, when you hear, hear about, we are informed about the World Trade Center's collapse, how trustworthy your own judgment is in comparison to the expert? I mean, I don't know, actually, and probably nobody else. So this is hardly applicable, but there is maybe an alternative way here in the vicinity, namely that you can use the Condorcet jury theorem or something approximate to that. And there, you can see this here, I mean, if you start with a certain reliability, let's say 0.65 of the individual judger, and you have larger uh, numbers in a group that uh, agree, then you approximate a probability of one soon. So if you have a lot of lay people who agree upon a certain proposition, you need not take to into account the expert belief view at all, but just see that the probability of the lay people's belief being true approximates one, and then you should go with that, of course. But the, the downside is, if you go below, below an individual uh, reliability below 0.5, just the opposite effects can be seen. So it quickly approximates to a probability of zero. And since, especially in cases of disagreement between lay people and experts, we do not know whether the lay people cross the thresholds of 0.5. Often they will be below because they find the expert's judgment outrageous, which shows that they are in, in, in huge distance to the experts, which are probably highly reliable. Uh, we do not know, we cannot know whether we can aggregate the judgment in this way. So I think this is all fine if we had the relevant information but lay people don't. 
And if, if they don't have that information, they cannot use this kind of technique. Okay. So I have 15 minutes left or something like that. So I've, yeah, let's see how far I get. So the third antidote is uh, stop thinking yourself in the face of expert views. So when lay people identify expert views or the uh, expert consensus, they should follow the expert's lead and stop thinking for themselves. Or they should no longer use domain specific reasons that amounts to the same. This does not require giving up thinking for oneself altogether, but only when you are exposed to expert beliefs. And the argument is here, is when you stop thinking for yourself, this fosters deference to the expert's view and resistance to conspiracy theories. So that is a helpful antidote, I guess. And when you implement that uh, in the relevant way, you get the following revised principle of thinking for oneself. I have uh, suggested that in public print already. So it reads, whenever you as a layperson rationally consider the truth of some proposition P, you must not stop using your own domain specific reasons for P unless you receive testimony regarding P from a, an identified expert. In that case, you are not permitted to use your own domain specific reasons any longer. Okay, so it's a, it's a restricted version of the principle of thinking for oneself. And now I start with a few challenges. So this gives you an impression how this theory might, might be integrated and might resist certain probably natural objections. So there's especially Jennifer Lecky, who has opposed this preemption view. She, for example, says in, the, in her first challenge that um, if the domain specific reasons are preempted, if the layperson is not allowed to use those reasons, uh, the layperson cannot recognize uh, domain specific experts, right? And then there is no identified expert for the layperson. And so the, the preemption rule cannot be applied to that situation. But I think there are replies. Uh, I think, consider for a moment the idea that the layperson might use her own domain specific reasons. I think on that basis, the layperson can never identify experts. Why not? I mean, a typical procedure here would be agreement or technically called calibration. But agreement with a layperson is not a good criterion for identifying an expert, right? The expert outperforms the layperson very often. So what you should expect is disagreement rather than agreement. But disagreement with a layperson is also not a good criterion. Why not? Because disagreement is ambiguous. Someone who disagrees with a layperson might be much better or superior to the layperson, but might also be an underperformer, right? a crack or so. So it can't tell you that this is really an expert. But secondly, I think there are, there is domain independent evidence, namely basically social evidence that might help the layperson to identify the expert, namely credentials. So reputation, education, awards, peer review publication, being accepted by other experts and so on and so forth. But there's a second uh, challenge also. Uh, Leckie thinks that um, if the preemption view were right, lay people would be, become powerless against misleading experts. And they are of course also misleading experts. First of all, there are false experts, which are not really, who are not really experts. But then there are also conspiracy entrepreneurs who try to bring people to conspiracy beliefs. And maybe the most difficult position or the most challenging position are predator, predatory uh, experts. Uh, those experts who are real experts, but at a certain, certain uh, spot misuse or abuse their power. So uh, there are medical experts want to try, uh, want to abuse or sexually abuse uh, small girls and just use their uh, potential expertise to justify their abuse. So there's this example of Nadar. Maybe we can talk about that later. But all these, in all these cases, there's a worry that the layperson cannot resist those, 
beliefs. And so by the very position is forced into accepting the experts or the so-called experts view. But there are, uh, of course, strategies to criticize and reject the expert views, but they have to rely on domain independent evidence. So for, for example, there may be disagreement uh, of one expert with other experts or even the majority. Or the layperson might identify biases, corruption, or bribery in the expert. This is also, of course, domain independent. Or there may be conflicts with truths from other domains. For example, if a philosopher is exposed to a biologist or so, he's, of course, not able to do good biology. But maybe the, the philosopher or the logician can see whether there are a fallacy in the reasoning, right? That's a still domain independent of biology. OK. And then there's a, there's a third challenge, namely epistemological obscurity. So I mentioned this view already. There is the widely accepted total evidence view, namely that all evidence should matter in your reasoning. And by ignoring your own domain-specific evidence, you do not correctly apply this norm of total evidence. You ignore evidence that is available to you. And that seems to be a mistake, a rational mistake. So what do you think to think about that? I think there are independent cases where ignoring evidence seems rationally permitted. So there are all these cases of higher order defeat. Assume that you calculate numbers correctly and then receive the misleading though trustworthy information, let's say from a mathematician that, or, or from a doctor that your ability to calculate is massively impaired by a drug. So you calculate it correctly, but you have the higher order evidence that your calculation ability was impaired. I think people would say in that case, you should not stick to your original result of calculation. You should suspend. And here we have a higher order, a piece of higher order evidence that specific first order evidence, uh, sorry, reasoning is irrational. And I think that can be applied to the case of expert testimony as well. So when you aggregate your first order evidence with expert testimony, this may involve a mistake of double counting of evidence. Because remember my analysis of experts, experts have more evidence than the lay people and the lay people know about that. So by using their own evidence and then using the judgment of the expert as extra evidence, although the judgment of the expert has already used the, your own evidence and more than that, you count twice the, the evidence, namely the domain specific evidence used by yourself and the domain specific evidence, your domain specific evidence that was already used by the expert. And this is a rationality mistake. So I, I think I have still time. So let me address some deeper worries. So you might think, yeah, yeah, so good, far so good, but uh, doesn't preemptive deference as you recommend us to, is to your trust really lead into the acceptance of false experts and charlatans? And so facilitates rather than resists or stops the spread of conspiracy theories. Uh, because in some sense, it promotes an uncritical attitude towards putative experts. So if someone is identified as an expert, even if it's a charlatan, then you just follow suit, right? You do not no longer critically uh, consider the, the, what the expert says. So doesn't that directly lead into conspiracy theory thinking rather than avoiding it? I think what should be said to that worry or responded to that worry is, that the lay people should use the right system of expert identification. So they should not rely on fame or reputation in society or in social media, but it should be reputation, acceptance, prestige within a proper expert selection system. So that makes sense, even from a lay pe people's point of view, and that might be science. Can't really go into the details here. Maybe you can also discuss this in the Q&A. But there might be people who generally distrust experts because they say it's just reputational, the so-called establishment elite, 
so-called experts, why should we trust them at all? And again, uh, what we should say here is that expert identification, as I said in my prior reply, does not rely on contingent social reputation, but assignment of reputation by the institution of science with all he, uh, its uh, specific characteristics like being international, being diverse, being peer reviewed, being self-correcting and so on. And consistent distrust in all these scientists would also undermine mind science in general and the reputation of science for the lay person. And that might be self undermining in the end. So all the lay people who believe in, in conspiracy theories still go, don't go to their doctors, uh, use their cars and some uh, common sense technologies which all rely on science. So there seems to be some kind of self undermining character here in this position. Complete distrust in science will, I mean, lead to a, a, a rural life without any technology and so on. And those people do not do that. So they are inconsistent. And the third worry is maybe we are often confronted with massively conflicting experts. And then there is no single expert view to defer to. And so again, the lay people must at the end rely on thinking themselves. But here are a few things I want to say. First is, I think many massive conflicts among experts are only apparent because we also take into account uh, charlatans, false experts, experts, so-called experts in the social media and so. If we just follow science, then maybe there are still majority views. And if they are not, if there are not, so if even in science, the views are controversial, we should not think for ourselves, but then suspend judgment. Because imagine that you will, would rely on thinking yourself in that case, then you would say something like the following. So the real, the problem is too complicated for the real experts really to, to settle that issue. But I, as a lay person who is epistemically inferior, I'm relying on my own reasoning with respect to that unsettled problem. That sounds not good to see the least, say the least. Okay, so I'm near the end. So let me just sum up. Um, so when lay people think for themselves in the face of expert testimony, this may result in conspiracy beliefs. To avoid this bad consequence, critical thinking of lay people must be severely restricted. This in turn involves a substantial revision of the enlightenment ideal of epistemic autonomy. Thinking for oneself is only one factor among others that can account for the spread of conspiracy beliefs. So that's a caveat from the start. And I think in real life cases of conspiracy beliefs or spreading conspiracy beliefs, thinking for oneself typically interacts with other relevant factors in multiple ways. So one way would be there is already prior to thinking for oneself, uh, our in-group commitments, prior distrust and experts, ideology and so on. But if in that situation, we then start thinking for ourselves, this amplifies the tendency to uh, believe conspiracy theories. Or secondly, if we are in highly pollu polluted uh, informational environments, so like the internet, where there's a lot of bad information, false information available, then this might be the background for our plausibility checks. And we select the most plausible from those available use. And that might mislead uh, your reasoning massively. You can see, I don't want to say that thinking for yourself is always a bad thing that always leads to conspiracy beliefs. It's more like in certain cases, it leads to these conspiracy beliefs. And in certain other cases, it is part of the story of explaining how conspiracy beliefs spread. Thank you very much for your attention. I think 